السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. إن شاء الله I will commence with a recitation from the Quran for purposes of baraka and invoking the blessings of the Almighty. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد ووالد وما ولد لقد خلقنا الإنسان في كبد أيحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلكت مالا لبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلقت حمل العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة فك رقبة أو إطعام في يوم ذي مسغبة يتيما ذا مقربة أو مسكينا ذا متربة ثم كان من الذين آمنوا وتواصوا بالصبر وتواصوا بالمرحمة أولئك أصحاب الميمنة والذين كفروا بآياتنا هم أصحاب المشأمة عليهم نار مؤصدة صدق الله العظيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهداه وبعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, and the one in control of absolutely everything. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. And may he bless all the messengers who came to us before him, including Jesus, may peace be upon him. Moses, may peace be upon him. Aaron or Harun, Lot, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the messengers. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon all of them, as well as their companions who strove with them to convey the goodness to others, as well as all the ulama or the scholars of the deen who have protected it, learned it, practiced it, conveyed it to others, and it has been thus preserved. And may the blessings be upon every single one of us and our offspring to come up to the end of time. And we also ask the Almighty that when Jesus Christ returns at the end of time, may our offspring be from amongst those who are with Him and not against Him. Amen. Honored scholars of Islam, brothers and sisters, it is a great honor to be standing here in front of you this evening. And indeed the topic that is under discussion, as we all know and was advertised, the fastest growing religion, Islam. We can tackle the subject from various angles and we can discuss it from many different aspects. But this evening I want to concentrate on something more universal. 
There are some who say Islam is not the fastest growing religion and they say that when you say the fastest, are you speaking about numbers or are you speaking about ratio or what are you referring to? Remember when we say a religion is growing, the first thing we need to know is those who are following it are not leaving it. Islam and obviously everything I say could be debated by someone who wants to argue but I'm giving you what we feel is correct according to our studies. Because I may get anyone from here who might argue and say, look, it's not the fastest growing religion. If you Google, for example, fastest growing religion, you might find people saying it's Christianity. I'm not here to debate that. Let's agree that it is growing and it is growing very fast. <laughs> there we are. So if that is the case, we need to understand that the number of people leaving it is very, very small, if any, compared to other religions. And that is a fact. You find Muslimin who have accepted Islam. My experience, and I, many people have accepted Islam, mashallah, in my presence. And I always tell them, the more you know of Islam, the more you will love it, the more you will practice it. The less you know, the more you will drift away from it. It's all got to do with how much you know. This is why the gift we have is the Quran. The Quran, subhanAllah, is amazing. It has an eloquence. It has a beauty to it that those who don't believe in the Quran, when they hear it being recited correctly, their hairs stand involuntarily in most cases. If they have any spirituality in them, they will recognize the spirituality of the Quran. And this is why I usually commence a talk with the recitation of the Quran. Take it easy, relax, read slow, read correct, and let it pierce. Pierce why? At times you won't know what it means, but you will recognize the divinity because by nature, everyone has spirituality in them. It is some who kill the spirituality later on, whilst others allow it to develop. So when we look at that, we will find even amongst the Muslims, there are some who read their five salah whilst others don't. But we, for our purposes, will still call them Muslim. Because we learn from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that if a person has signs of disbelief and a sign of belief, we will consider them believers. And we leave the judging to the Almighty. Allah says in the Quran, in the opening surah, Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the owner of the day of judgment. He has set aside an entire day which will be longer than 500. In fact, more, the, the, hadith, the Quran says, it will be more than 50,000 years. 50,000 years of the years that we know in this world. So the day of judgment itself. The verse makes mention of how that day of judging will be equivalent to 50,000 years of the years we know, but all in one day. Subhanallah. So Allah says, I've set aside a day to judge. We should not be judgmental. When it comes to a person, apparently they might appear to be someone who might not be so spiritual yet. Between them and their creator, they are more spiritual than myself and yourselves. So we do not judge because sometimes I might appear to be extremely, extremely religious. Yet I have hidden qualities of hypocrisy. May Allah safeguard all of us. But that can happen. So if that is the case, that would also mean that there could be a person who might not appear to be so religious. But deep down, they know how close they are to their creator. They stay away from stealing, cheating, deceiving, gossip, slander, and involving in the lives of others and making others' lives difficult and so on. And maybe the Almighty might love that deed and then grant them entry into paradise without even taking account. Because what we do know as Muslimin, there are large numbers of people, may Allah make us from amongst them, who will enter paradise without any reckoning, no reckoning. Just because He loves a single deed that you may have done, and sometimes it's difficult to do a deed. Like, to be very honest with you, sometimes because we are living in a certain environment, it becomes difficult to even identify yourself as a Muslim. I was having a chat with someone today in quite a public place, and we were discussing how difficult it is sometimes in environments to actually say that you're a Muslim. And I said, well, if that's the case, then the one who can identify himself as a Muslim and understands the freedoms he or she has in a country like this, 
you know, to be free, to be whom you would like to be, and then they stand up for that, knowing that, look, there's no point in disassociating yourself from Islam just because a few ignorant people might have tried to spoil the image of Islam by engaging in acts that are unacceptable Islamically. So now we must all pretend like we're not Muslims. We can make the difference by being Muslim and still greeting and still helping. If you see, for example, an old lady with a bag running down, and I'm telling you what happened today, for example, coming down the steps, maybe at, at a train station and so on, you can offer help. She might look at you. She might not take your help, possibly, but it will go into her head to say somebody offered help with a smile. And really they offered it genuinely. And the next person that offers similar help, she probably will take it. Who said it's wrong to help someone? It is an act of religion. That's what makes you a Muslim. That is why Islam is growing fast. Believe me, Islam is not growing fast because people are watching Muslims. No. If Islam was based on watching Muslims today, we would be having negative growth because we have turned away from our own teachings. It's a fact. Let's not deny. We have turned away from the beautiful teachings of Islam. Yes, if we, and I hope we who are seated here, are from amongst those who are trying, inshallah, that's the start. That's the start. You know, I always teach that if you are moving a step at a time, it is definitely in the right direction. If you were to pass away in that condition, Allah knows that you were heading in one direction. Had I given you a longer life, you'd have probably headed right to perfection. May Allah grant us, obviously, some form of goodness. Nobody's going to get to perfection. But at least if we get somewhere near, or if we try, we might get somewhere. I tell people, aim beyond the skies and you might get to the clouds. But that's good enough. Alhamdulillah. So this is why we need to know that as Muslims, if we are walking in the right direction and gaining and achieving and learning every day, inshallah, we will be preserving our religion and that preservation will be a step in confirming the statement fastest growing religion. Because at least the people who are in it are actually growing in faith, growing in knowledge. So it's fastest growing religion, not necessarily in numbers if some would like to argue, but at least in quality. Alhamdulillah, those who are there, quality. There's no point in people saying we are Christians and then they don't know that Christianity also teaches you to dress modestly. And then they tell you, well, modest, the interpretation of it changes from time to time. Well, if that's the case, Islam is so beautiful, it just sets a framework and that's it. And Islam says you can always improve no matter where you've got to. There's nothing called perfection. Nobody is perfect, meaning let me word that again. There might be perfection, but nobody can get there. The winner is the one who aims in that direction. So this is why it's extremely important for us to know that as Muslimin, and this was the point I was making, the more you know, the more powerful, the more solid a Muslim you will be, and you will find you'll enjoy your life. You'll really enjoy it. Islam has lots of rules and regulations. Why then is it growing so fast? Why do you find people in a free society choosing to allow the rules of Islam which society considers voluntary? When I say society considers voluntary, nobody is shoving down your throat to be a Muslim here. Society would probably allow you to be atheistic or gay or lesbian. But people voluntarily choose to become more religious. Why? When they know Islam has so many rules and regulations. I give the example and I want to repeat it here again tonight of schools and education. In my part of the world, if you have a government school, the rules and regulations are very little. They'll tell you you appear in uniform or no uniform, it's fine. You've paid the fee or no fee, it's okay. You can come in, you have a seat, you know, you can do whatever you'd like and everything is okay. You come and listen to your teacher talk and after that you go. But when it comes to a school that is a private school in my part of the world, there are lots of rules and regulations. To start with, you need to sit for an interview and tell them how your parents are going to contribute to the upliftment of the school. I'm talking of my part of the world. And then the father needs to say, well, I can resurface the tar here. You know, Zimbabwe is full of potholes. I'm sure you know. <laughs> Strangely, I found a few of those down here. Maybe there's a lot of Zimbabweans who relocated, mashallah. <laughs> Obviously, that's on a lighter note. Don't take it seriously. 
So as I was saying, the, the parent has to come in and say, how am I going to contribute to the school? And then you find the child needs to be playing a sport and if the child is good at a sport and so on, they have a greater chance in being accepted. And once you are, you need to wear the uniform every day. The blazer needs to be, you know, a certain size and a certain way the tie needs to be worn and you need to have garters. I don't know if you're aware of what garters are. To hold your socks up. I know, I wore those. Yes, garters. Once I didn't have my garters and they told me to write, and I just want to share this with you. They told me to write, I think it was three pages on garters. And I wrote about the warm Russian garters and I made up stories of everything and anything. And I, I recall that that is how we were actually brought up, subhanAllah, with lots of rules and regulations. So that school that has lots of rules and regulations will create men and women who are an asset to society, gentlemen. I can pick up a person who's been to a good secular school just by the way they greet me. Believe me, in a lot of cases, in my part of the world. If someone comes to you, they're quite confident of themselves and they will greet you. They, they happen to shake your hand properly. They will smile at you and they will say a few polite words. They might offer you assistance. You know, this person's been to a good school. And if you are to ask them, and I've done it, you will find nine times out of ten, they've been to one of the private schools where there are lots of rules and regulations. If ma'am passes, you get up and say, morning ma'am, even if she doesn't look at you. But if you didn't say that, she'll look at you and say, right, what's your name? You're in detention. There you are. It's a fact because that was discipline. So Islam, getting back to the example I'm drawing, it has a rule regarding how you look, how you walk, how you talk, how you eat, how you sleep, how you operate, how you cooperate. Subhanallah. Everything is governed. But the more you adopt, the better a person you will be. The less you know, you will begin to think Islam is a fanatic religion that's full of extremism. And Islam is a religion that teaches you that anyone who's not you is an infidel and they are meant to be slaughtered and they're meant all that is ignorance it is lack of knowledge it, it is people who are seizing the ignorance of the masses regarding their own faith to con them that this is what it is you're going to paradise everyone's going to hell so why send them to hell right now by making their life difficult let them live their lives here may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness to the degree that if there is a non-Muslim, we cannot say whilst they are alive that we are better than them because who knows their end and our end. We might end up a person who is sacrilegious, whereas they might come up with the best form of spirituality. They might enter the fold, the, the, the fold of submission and be better people than myself and yourselves. You know, there are so many narrations of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who has shown that there are people who enter paradise for small deeds. There was a woman who was a prostitute May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And she had consideration for a dog that was dying of thirst. Consideration for a dog that was dying of thirst. Look at her heart. It softened up for an animal. And she decided, no, you know what? Let me quench the thirst of this dog. And the hadith, the prophet, peace be upon him, says she achieved paradise through that. There was no discussion of whether or not she was belonging to this sect or that and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love at least some of our deeds. Because the, the problem is when we think we are it and we think, right, I'm the most religious person. I'm the most spiritual person. That itself is a quality of Satan. What did Satan do? When Allah created Adam, Satan says, Ana khayrun minhu. Why did you create this Adam? I'm better than him. <laughs> you created me from a smokeless fire and you created him from soil or sand or dust. I'm better. That word, I'm better, rendered him worse. So when Allah instructed him, to acknowledge the level of Adam, he said, I don't want. There we are. So this is why we do not acknowledge sometimes the levels of those around us because we begin to develop devilish qualities through ignorance. We forget the story of Adam, yet it is in the Quran. So in the Quran, there, there are verses that will teach us or verses that have rules and regulations. There are others that have stories of the past. Those stories of the past are not meant to be read as stories of the past alone, but we are meant to take lesson from it. We are meant to take lesson from it. Some of those 
stories of the past might not be applicable right here, right now, but we learn a lesson. For example, some of the wars are mentioned in the Quran. Some of the battles are mentioned in the Quran as notes of history to teach not only the Muslims, but anyone who wants to pick the Quran up to say this is what happened and this is how the battle was won and this is how it was lost and this is what happened for the battle to have been won and to have been lost and so on. Those verses are there just like the history books are in front of us when we study a battle that occurred maybe with the Soviet Union or maybe in the Falklands or maybe elsewhere and we read these books and we see and those who want to learn a lesson will be able to derive a lesson that this is where things can go wrong and this is how things can go right. But when we read the stories of the previous prophets and the messengers and how guidance came to them, when guidance came to them, their people divided into two categories. There were those who accepted the message and there were those who denied the message. And there were those from amongst those who denied the message who made life difficult for the messengers and there were those who denied the message but remained dormant. And, and there were several categories and the end result was always the success of the prophet and the demise of the others. Always. So what do we learn from that? As Muslims, what we learn from that is Whenever there is a message towards goodness, if we adopt it, we will be successful, even if it is difficult to adopt. To be truthful, to abstain from gossip. You know, it's amazing sitting. Every time you meet someone, you sit with them for more than 20 minutes, they begin to talk about this one and that one. I don't know why. I used to think it was a female habit, but sadly I was wrong. It's actually affected the males in a bigger way. I don't know if it's the change of dress or what it is. May Allah protect us. Really. Why speak about someone else's life when the hadith, the Prophet says, Tuba liman shagalahu aibuhu an ayubin nas. Give good news of a place in paradise to the one whose own weaknesses occupies him or her from engaging in the lives of others in a negative way. Why do we want to talk about somebody else? Worry about yourself. If you want to engage in his or her life, do it positively. Mashallah. Positively, I want to help you and we should not help someone because we want them to revert or convert We help them because we are taught to help them. The rest is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So I am only mentioning here some of what keeps people within Islam and there comes a time when people realize and I've come across Muslims who at times have lived their lives not as Muslims and then clock the age of 40 and 50 and they have their children and the children are growing up and they watch their children doing exactly what they did and sometimes even worse because the hadith says khayrun nasi qarni alunahum, alunahum. the best of generations is mine and then the next and then the next and it will go on degenerating until the end of time so in a general note or on a general note our parents generation was it better than us in terms of morality and social conduct and spirituality and so on and those before them were even better and as time passes we will find it getting worse we will find it getting worse generally there might be pockets of people who are slightly better but generally it will get worse and this is why you find another quotation ma'rufu zamanina munkaru zamanin qad mada wa munkaru zamanina ma'rufu zamanin sayati that which we consider okay and fine has been taboo with those of a previous generation. And that which we consider taboo will be okay and fine with those who will come. You know, I've been reading a book, and I'm sure you can get it. It's written by Muhammad al-Arifi Sheikh. And he, it, it's, it's the world, the end of the world. That's the name of the book. I'm sure you get it in the bookshops. It's printed by Darul Salam. Powerful book for Muslims and non-Muslims. Signs of the end of the world mentioned by Muhammad. May peace be upon him. One by one, every single sign is coming. If it's not already there, we can see it coming. Subhanallah. And as you read it, you don't feel like stopping because you know these are prophecies that are correct. They are accurate. And this is what draws people to Islam. Speaking about why the religion is growing fast, they see the prophecies. And they see that these prophecies are not just like Nostradamus. According to me, Nostradamus is a big hoax. That's my own view and I'm entitled to it. Why? Every time a thing happens, then they say, oh, it was predicted because his 
His, he, whatever he's written is written in code form. You can interpret it anyway. So after it happens, you say, yeah, Nostradamus had already predicted that. Do you know? Because you've interpreted it that way. These are not like that. Clear cut narrations from Muhammad, peace be upon him. When he tells you women will dress in order to be undressed. Oh, you look at it. You, you know, it's something. Kasiyatin, ariyatin, ma'ilatin, mumilatin. He describes even the hairstyles of the women at that time. And the Sahaba were looking and saying, what? But today we see it. A lot of women out there, they would dress in order to reveal, not in order to cover. There we are. There we are. So mashallah, you've covered from head to toe. But I can see your body in a better way than I would. Had you been naked, may Allah protect us. Like one of my <laughs> colleagues used to say, well, I think let's leave that. Because to be honest with you, look, we respect everybody's... <laughs> we respect everybody's freedom of choice. But at the same time, the reality is we need to think. We need to think where we're heading. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all. It doesn't let the men loose at all. But what it does is we need to be conscious of other things as well. And really, we need to pray for one another. And I always say, when you see a female dressed in a manner that is unacceptable Islamically, do not for a moment think that she is, she is lower than you spiritually. Don't. If you do that, you are lower than her. Believe me, that's the teaching of your religion. She might have a link with her creator that you do not know about. She might have a heart that is tons better than yours. She might have a weakness that is outward and you have 50 weaknesses that are hidden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. This is why we never judge. And anyone who judges, wallahi, they have failed. And this is where we are not succeeding in the world today. We find people, and I've come across it myself. You, you pass them, and you find they wouldn't greet you. Why? Because you're walking with a gentleman who's clean shaven, and you know, they say, ah, why are you associating with that man? Well, you might have 10 beards stuck one after the other, dragging five meters, <laughs> dragging five meters on, you know, like a wedding gown, mashallah. The only thing is it's black. But your heart might be charcoal, whereas the person moving in front of you might be a person whose heart is as blessed as snow. And the only thing they're lacking is the outward dress. That's it. May Allah guide us all. This is why Islam is growing very rapidly. When those who want to learn the religion know what I've just told you now, they're attracted to it. But then they become Muslimin when they start interacting with the Muslims and they come across a few know-it-alls. What happens is, subhanallah, sometimes they are distracted. And this is why we say to everyone who is here, learn Islam and learn it in its pristine, pure form. Wallahi, read the books of the life of Muhammad, may peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you will see how he lived. There are so many quotations. Look. Why does Islam grow? I'd like to give you an example. At the time of the messenger, may peace be upon him, there was a woman who hated his guts because obviously she was fed. And this is what happens on the globe today. People who dislike Islam and hate it, it's because of a few reasons. One of them is they're fed either by the media or by what other Muslims are doing or just by what they've heard from the time they were born. They've been fed that you know what? These people are bad. They are terrorists. They are hooligans. They are this. The minute you see a big beard, you run in the other direction. So much so that if you go to some so-called Muslim countries like I've been to Egypt where they look at you with a beard and the little children say, Irhabi, Irhabi. You know what that means? A terrorist, terrorist, you know? <laughs> and you look and you say, Yeah, well, like, you know? And you're saying, if our own Muslim children are doing this, what do you expect of those who are not part of the faith? But it's because they've been brainwashed as time passes. They've been brainwashed. And I'm sure those of us who interact with non-Muslims, and we are proper Muslims, they will develop a liking for those who are, you know, strong enough to actually be an outward Muslim as well as an inward Muslim. And then they find these are the most helpful people, the most loving, the most kind, the best, I know of instances where people who are not Muslim say to themselves, and they've discussed it, and we've discussed it on several forums, or in several forums, where they would say, you know what, I'd like a Muslim husband, because he doesn't drink, he doesn't gamble, he's at home all the time, this is what he does, that's what, and they're ready to say, look, that's what I want, there you are. Subhanallah. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us really true champions of the deen. Islam has in it the ingredients of everything. The problem with us is we don't want to follow the ingredients. I tell the women, a lot of the times I have a tafsir every Sunday. I see some of the sisters that I know here. Uh, I tell them, you know, when there is a cake to be made, the sisters know, some of the brothers would also know now, mashallah. That you know, you need to follow it to the T. They give you the ingredients, you prepare everything, you put it aside, then they give you the method, and mashallah, you prepare everything, and then they tell you this is what you need, and in Zimbabwe, you've got the generator on standby just in case the power goes, and mashallah, you know, everything is there and ready, subhanallah, and then you follow it to the T. Why? You would like to see a cake at the end. Is that not right? Correct. You want to see a cake at the end. Well, Islam has for you all ingredients and the method and everything and tells you, you will see a beautiful cake at the end. But we do everything, we're not prepared to put it in the oven. So it sits and then what happens? We're Muslims, but half Muslims. So we have a cake that's flopped. Because what happens? They tell you, look, don't open the oven all the time. Because if you keep opening it, it will flop. Be careful of him. He is poisonous. He's a magician. He is a, a liar. And when you, if you look at his face, if you look at his face, he bewitches you to the degree that you begin to follow him. Reminds me of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. I don't know if you remember the story. If you hear his words, you begin to adopt. So don't even see him. Just stay very far from him. Don't even go near him. Do you know what he's doing? He is swearing our forefathers. Now obviously there was no swearing of the forefathers, but there was obviously explanation that the forefathers were upon that which was incorrect, which was wrong. And he sa she says, he says that you're not allowed to worship idols and these idols have saved us from so much and so much and they've done this for us and that for us and now so many years later he wants us to leave these idols and he wants us to do this and to do that. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued walking with her. It was easy for, her, for, for him to drop it down and say, thank you very much, carry it, it's me, I'm going. <laughs> if, if someone was assisted by you, and then they told you, watch out, the worst person in this whole varsity is the guy with this name, that happens to be you, you might spit on their face, may Allah protect us. To say, I'm helping you, look at what you're doing. You're telling me I'm the worst, okay? Take this, do it yourself. I think that would be still light, according to us, because others would probably blurt out 20 swear words, you know? So Muhammad sallallahu remained silent. Up to the point they got to her house, he didn't say one word. And throughout the journey, she is just speaking horrible about him. He is a man this way, that way. He is so bad. He is like this. He is in Makkah. He's caused a split in our community. He's caused disaster. He is terrible. He is this. He is that. And he remained silent. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left her belongings in the house and said, is there anything else I can do for you? Imagine, look at the politeness. Look at this. Look at this. This is what spreads Islam. Is there anything else I can do for you, ma'am? No. Thank you very much. As he's going, hey, hang on. But who are you? What's your name? Now comes the opportunity. <laughs> but how to say it? He says, you know, as I picked up your goods there, you started speaking about a man. And you said whatever you said. You said he's this, he's that, he's that, he's that, you know. And you said his name is Muhammad bin Abdullah. I just want to let you know that my name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah al Hashimi al Qurashi. What do you think happened to her? Gob smacked. Silence. Silence. Dead silence. And then she says, In kana kadalik. If that is the case, if that is the case, fa inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that the God you are calling to, one, the Creator, He is the God and you are the messenger. There's no doubt, I don't have a doubt. Nobody can do what you've just done. Nobody, absolutely nobody. She accepted the faith and she learned a lot about the religion and she became a good Muslim. Imagine. Through what? Through character. This is why the narration says, The best from amongst you. Have you. I'm sure you've come across several hadith. The Muslims, we are the bulk here, I'm sure. You've come across several hadith which say the best from amongst you is this. The best from amongst you is that. When you ask the sisters, do you know any of these narrations? They'll say, yes, the best from amongst you are those who are best to their wives. 
I'm sure they, they, they've memorized that one. <laughs> so there's no contradiction because the hadith says, Khiyarukum ahasinukum akhlaqan. The best from amongst you are those who have best character and conduct. No narration says the best from amongst you are those who pray five times a day. The best from amongst you are those who read the most Quran. The best from amongst you are those who give zakat. The, because that is part and parcel of the deen. It is farad. It is compulsory. It is there. But what makes you the best is your character development, your conduct as a Muslim. And where are you going to learn character and conduct from? From reading the life experiences of the messenger, may peace be upon him. That is what makes you a better Muslim. So the narration says, the best from amongst you are those who are best to their spouses. That's included in good character and conduct, no contradiction. It's only, you know, getting somewhere more specific. Because it's needed at home more, home more. This is why in Islam we are taught that if your wife or your family members can bear witness that you are a good man, you are definitely a good man. That's what Islam teaches. Not if your friends say so, or those you mix with say so, no. Because it's easy for you to be the cool guy outside the home. And when you come home, you say, hey, what's this? And you throw everything in tantrums and you don't want to talk and you just plonk yourself in front of the television throughout the night. They know what goes on in the house. They watch you 24 seven. But when you come to varsity, mashallah, dressed well, nice smile with everybody. And you know, greet those whom you don't even have to, for example, you know, unnecessarily and keep on greeting them five, six times. I don't know if you had used one of those five or six at home, you'd have solved your problem. And I tell people that, you know, when we smile, mashallah, we show teeth, isn't it? We show teeth. Sometimes when we smile at people, really, outside the home, we show them all our teeth. And at home, it's a smirk once in a while. <laughs> if you show half of those teeth in your home, you become a better Muslim. Wallahi, I'm not joking. You become a better Muslim, a Muslim, just by smiling. Imagine the narration says, fi wajhi akhika sadaqa. You know this, that's why I'm mentioning the narration. To smile at the face of the other is an act of charity. It solves problems, it resolves matters, it is what brings people together, it is what spreads Islam, it is what is making Islam the fastest growing religion. To smile at someone is an act of charity. What if that person happens to be your family member and on top of that your spouse or your children or your parents, it is an act of charity upon an act of charity, upon another act of charity and so on. But we take it for granted. Go home and you're all gloomy. But two minutes ago, when you were speaking to that girlfriend of yours, you were smiling at the phone. Allahu Akbar. She couldn't even see you. Wallahi, she couldn't even see you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us that look, character and conduct is what takes us further. I want to give you a case study of Indonesia. Al Jawa, they call it Jawa or Jawa. It is the most populous Islamic country, I'm sure you're aware of that, close on to 200 million, if not more, Muslims in one country. How did Islam get there? Have you ever studied it? Basic, simple. There are two or three versions, but one will tell you, they're all heading in the same direction, that it is through the business people who came from the Arabian Peninsula to trade. They didn't come for direct da'wah. But as a Muslim, you're a da'i. You already call people towards Islam just by your name. Like I tell people that, you know, you, you can't hide your identity. You're a Muslim, you're a Muslim. Your eyes say it. Just look at the eyes. They tell you this person's a Muslim. Straight. And if you feel like you want to hide it, when they ask you, what's your name, sir? You've got to say Abdul Aziz. So they know that that's a Muslim name. Done. You know? I noticed some of the people trying to disguise that by keeping the children's names, some weird names. You know, they ask you, well, you know, can I keep the name? Let me not say it in case somebody's name is that. But a name that sounds extreme. <laughs> you have to be considerate. Come on. I mean, it's not your fault. It's your parents who named you that, isn't it? Unless you change your name later on. But if someone is intentionally keeping a name so that they can disguise the fact that they're Muslim, they're paying a disservice to the whole world, to the whole world, to themselves to start with. So what's the point? You know, I told a person who asked me a certain name. They said, Why do, what is the meaning of this? And I said, it has no meaning in the Arabic language. It's just an adjective. 
So if you want to keep your child's name an adjective, you can. He said, well, I don't see a problem with that. So I said, hang on, I've got a better name. Maduna. Maduna means without. So why don't you keep your child's name without? Because it sounds very close to another name. And they said, oh, wow, good idea. I was joking and they're taking it seriously. <laughs> there you are. So to be honest with you, we as Muslimin need to really be proud of our religion. And I noticed that the more you know of Islam, the more proud you become, the more it is consolidated and the more it spreads to others. I've sat with a lot of people and asked them why they've entered the fold of Islam. And in a lot of cases, you will be surprised. It's because of interaction with Muslims. Interaction. And in a lot of cases too, it is because they're fed up with what they have. And I'd like to get to these two points. Going back to the point I was speaking about, the point on the concept of Godhood. In Islam, we have direct access to our Maker. What is the meaning of the term Allah? I know there are many people who've said a lot, but if we take that word and we try and, you know, find the meaning of it, where it came from, Ibrahim, Abraham, may peace be upon him, he used that term. It is in the Hebrew language as well, Elohim or Eloha. You will find it even in the Old Testament. And you find the word Allah in the Arabic language from the root Aliha Ya'lahu. Al-Ma'luhu Allahu. Al-Ma'luhu Aliha means to worship. So Ma'luh is the worshipped one. When Abraham was looking for God, he was looking for who made him. Because his parents were worshipping idols. And his father was making the idols. And he says, Ya Abati. Beautiful verses, listen to them. Ya Abati lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yubusiru wa la yugni anka shay'a. Oh my father, why are you worshipping that? which cannot hear, it cannot see, and it can't even help you. You're making idols, and you know you're selling them. And those with a lot of money are buying bigger gods than others, to the degree that when those who don't have money have a big problem, they come to borrow the god of those with a lot of money, because they got a bigger problem than the little god can solve. <laughs> That's what was happening. And foolish people really thought it was correct. Umar ibn al-Khattab himself says, so many years later when he was a Muslim, he says, there was a time when I had a god made of dates, and I was hungry, and I asked for food, and I didn't get it, so I ate the dates. <laughs> Wallahi, you will find that. And he says, then I realized how foolish I was only after I accepted Islam, because my beloved brothers and sisters, the environment you live in has the biggest impact on you. The biggest impact on you is the environment you're living in. Those who you mix with, they make your mind up for you. They, may, they think for you. The environment around you thinks for you. If you sit and watch telly whole day, that's your brain. It's not your own cells that you're using. You're using something behind the screen that you don't even know. If you're sitting on the net all day, depending on the sites you look at, that is you. That's what makes you. If you mix with good people, that's who you will be. You mix with bad people, that's who you will be. So that is the environment. At that time, they couldn't see the light because everybody was doing that. So that is why they simply didn't see it. Abraham, may peace be upon him, was young, but he saw it at a very early age. He began to question. This can't be my God. So then he left. He says, I've been seeing the stars for a long, long time since I was born. But today I'm thinking possibly this might be my God. So he'd seen the stars many times. He never thought that it was his God. But the day he looked at it with a different eye, he started thinking. And this shows us that you might see something passing every day. You might see a Muslim cross your path every day, but you won't actually think because it's just something you haven't thought about. But when you sit and you think, why are these people choosing to be so, you know, ruled by their religion? For what? What kick do they get out of it? Wallahi, there is. Not a kick, but mashallah, you know, it smoothens you down, alhamdulillah. Until you don't consider that, you won't actually be able to come up with answers. So Ibrahim saw the stars. He said, no, the moon is bigger. Then he saw the moon and he says, hang on. If I've got a problem during the daylight, the moon is not going to be able to help me because there's a sun that's even stronger. Then he's seen the sun. He says, okay, that's my God. This is mentioned in the Quran. He says, that's my God. It's massive. It's big and it's warm. It's possibly this. Yes. Then he says, but hang on, it's setting. If I've got a problem at night, what do I do? Who do I call out to? He says, no. Then he made the, the declaration of monotheism, which we all surrender to. 
which we all surrender to. He says, after he says, I cannot worship the sun because it sets, he says, Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal arda hanifa wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. I have turned my face in submission to whoever has created the skies and the earth and whatever lies between it and I will not associate any partners with the maker of all that subhanallah that is who Allah is so Allah is the worshipped one what does that mean whoever made me I call him the worshipped one no risk involved nothing at all if someone asked me who do you worship I said whoever made me is there anything that now they can argue about nil they have to submit to it. Even the Pope will nod his head. It's a fact. And I'm saying it, you know, respectfully. Because you can't debate with that. That is Islam. Islam says you worship the one who made you. When I say Allahu Akbar, I'm saying the one who created me is the greatest. That's what I'm saying. So we translated Allah is the greatest. So a lot of the non-Muslims think that, well, you know what that means? That means the Allah that these people worship in is the greatest. Well, he's not. Astaghfirullah. But that's what they might think because they don't know what, what it actually means. It means the worshipped one is the greatest. Who is the worshipped one? Whoever made me and everything, he's the greatest. So Allahu Akbar, the one who's being worshipped by me is the greatest. The creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, the one who controls everything is the greatest. He is the greatest. As I said, everybody has to nod their heads to say, you're right. Then when I say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, what am I saying? All praise is due to the one who is the Rabb of Al Alameen, the one who created, the one who nourishes, cherishes, provides, protects, and so on. All the creation, all the worlds put together, everything in creation, all praise is due to he, to the worshipped one, whose qualities are this, this, and this. Owner of the day of judgment and so on and so on. And so. so that Surah Al-Fatiha itself, if you read it correctly, it guides you to Islam. Then what did Abraham say? He says, look, I render all my acts of worship to Allah. And then he says, Arina manasikana. Oh Allah, I want you to show me how to worship you. Show me all our manasik. Show me what we should be doing. Show me what I should be doing. How do you want to be worshipped, Ya Allah? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously, there is a long story of Ibrahim, and I'm sure uh, the, the, the Old Testament has it slightly different. They say that Isaac or Ishaq was the one who was the sacrifice, and uh, the Muslims believe it was Ismail. From a historic point of view, we also believe that Ishaq was not in the picture at the time. But there is that debate. I don't want to go into it. The Christians believe one way, the Muslims believe the other. Whoever it was from the two, what I would like to raise is the sacrifice of Ibrahim. Once he knew that this is coming from my creator, he was ready to submit and surrender. He knew that my success lies in adopting what my creator is saying. But Allah did not allow him to go beyond a certain point with that which didn't make sense to him. When he was ordered and instructed to sacrifice his son, it did not make sense to him. It didn't. But he says, hey, if it's coming from the Creator, there must be some bigger plan. There must be something. There is something. He spoke to his son. His son admitted. And that was at that time, because if it happened now, today, I don't think there would be an Abraham on the face of the earth. And if there was, there wouldn't be the Ismail that there was. And then Allah had a bigger plan. And all that was only to prepare him for something to come. Allah says, oh Ibrahim, you found me. Listen to this. You found me. You worshipped me. You obeyed my instruction whether you understood it or not. You gave preference to me over you. I declare you a very close friend of mine. That is the term in Arabic, Khalil. Allah says, Allah has taken Ibrahim, or Abraham may peace be upon him, as a Khalil. And then he started making dua. Making dua meaning praying. He started calling out. When he says, 
Oh my God, oh Allah, oh my Creator, I want you to give me this, to give me that, this city, let the people's hearts want to come to it, give them produce, give them goodness, keep them secure, do this, do that for me, do this for me. Allah says, we give you everything you ask for, oh Abraham. We give you whatever you want. He says, keep my progeny. He made prayers, he prayed for his progeny. Keep my offspring on the right path that I have found. Don't take them away. Allah says, do you know what? All the messengers to come after you will be from your family. So whether it was Jacob, Joseph, Isaac, Ismail, whether it was uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jesus, uh, John, John, Zachariah, all of these, may peace be upon them all, were from his family. All of them. Amazing. Look at the gift of Allah. So when you are steadfast, Allah chooses your offspring to be steadfast as well. Then come Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us monotheism. He taught us that you do not confess your sin to any human being. Never. Your sin is your secret between you and the one who made you. And he forgives you. Islam is based on mercy. This is also a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. Islam is based on pure mercy. Why do we say that? Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most forgiving, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim We hear the words most forgiving, most merciful and so on. Obviously, Islam has a balance between what is known as Khawf and Raja. Al-Imanu Bain Al-Khawf Wal Raja. The Prophet says, may peace be upon him, belief is between having hope and fearing. Because if there's only hope, you will keep on doing wrong and have hope. You know, when there is a person who is never jailed for something bad they've done, because every time they go there, the judge is their friend. May Allah protect us. I'm just thinking of an example off the cuff. And then the judge lets them off. Will they ever stop committing the sin or the fraud? No, because they know I'm going to be let loose anyway. The system is mine. Like the tyrants you have sometimes across the globe, when their children commit a sin, they're above the law. So they can do whatever they want. If that's the case, they will not stop because they know they're above the law. But when it comes to Allah, Allah says, hang on, we want to balance it with a bit of fear so that you come on the path. Subhanallah. It's a path, neither this way nor that way. It's in the middle. So the hadith says, every time a worshiper seeks the forgiveness of the creator, he purifies them to the degree that they become as pure as a person who's never sinned. At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kamalla the narration says one who repents from a sin is equivalent to the one who hasn't ever committed a sin. And what is repentance? You confess to your creator, your maker, oh you who made me, oh you whom I'm going to return to. I've done wrong. I admit it. So you need to admit your error. I regret it. You need to regret it. I ask you to forgive me and I won't do it again. Four conditions. If you have those four conditions, the narration says, it is impossible for the Almighty not to forgive you. And for you to then think I'm not forgiven, that is the devil getting hold of you. Because Allah is telling you, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الظُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh Muhammad, peace be upon him, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves that Allah forgives every single sin, every single sin. Don't ever lose hope in Allah's mercy. For he is most forgiving, most merciful. So what the devil does, he makes us think that, nah, I'm not forgiven. He's, he can't be that merciful that he's forgiving me. You know, I've done it one too many times. May Allah protect us. That is falling in the clutches of the devil. Someone might ask, well, what if I've repeated the sin? For as long as when you asked for forgiveness, you hadn't planned to repeat it again. And you had met the four conditions and you promised you weren't going to do it again. If human nature took you there, though you tried to force yourself not to do it, Allah will still forgive you even a second time and a third. And even infinity times. May Allah protect us. Allah has no limits. He says, I forgive everything. You be genuine. The one narration says when a person constantly seeks Allah's forgiveness and you know human error makes them fall back into it then Allah says after a certain time he calls the angels and he says Alima abdi anna lahu rabban ya'khudu bi dhambi wa yaghfiruh 
أُشْهِدُكُمْ أَنِّي غَفَرْتُ لَهُ Oh my angels, look at this worshiper. He now knows that there is a creator who can punish him and who can forgive him. I just want you to bear witness I've forgiven him. Because now you acknowledge what makes you a, a believer. What makes you a believer is when you regret what wrong you're doing. Look what the Prophet says. إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنٌ If your good deed makes you happy and your bad deed makes you regret, that's a sign that you're a believer. Subhanallah. Because if you're not a believer, you wouldn't regret anything. You walk here and there, whether it's alcohol or anything else, or whether you've just committed adultery or not, you don't bat an eyelid. Nothing happens to you. But if you've done something wrong and you feel, hey, I shouldn't have done that. It was a waste of money, waste of time. I was just drunk for a while, or I just did this for a while, and so on. Very bad. That's a sign of that flicker within you of belief. May Allah open our doors. And this is what we as Muslimin need, because this is what the non-Muslims read. They see it and they understand it better than us, because they've been in the darkness. If you go to the United States of America, you can actually research this. I've done it. The, the age group and the gender of those who are accepting Islam, females between the ages of 30 and 50. And generally professionals. When we say professionals, we're talking of people who have degrees and qualifications. Lawyers and doctors and so on. Why? A lot of them will tell you, I have seen the life that enslaves you out there. Everybody judges you for what you have, for what you look like, for your weight, for your nose, for your eyes, for your makeup, for your scent, for your smell, for everything. Islam doesn't do that. Islam tells you, you know what, just put on a cloak and walk out. That's it. Nobody needs to know what shape you are, what size you are. And if there's anything, somebody will appreciate it so much if you dress accordingly and so on. So they feel liberated with the hijab. They feel liberated. They tell you that is true liberation. I was reading an article, very interesting, saying that those who think that they are liberated by wearing Calvin Klein clothing and by wearing all these other designer clothing, they should know that most of those designers are men. So their men have actually enslaved you to the degree that you don't even know. They're deciding what you wear. When I read that, I was shocked because I never looked at it that way. Might be true, but that's a trend. It moves. Islam says, look, display your beauty to whom it is supposed to be displayed to. And they will appreciate it. You know, if you, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Really, if you are to look into this and go deep into it, it makes a lot of sense. But at the end of the day, as I said, the world around us, is free. Everybody is there to choose whether they want this part or that part because they are responsible for their choices. And this is why as Muslimin, whenever we call out to Islam, we should never be forceful. Islam, there is no compelling when it comes to entry into deen. La ikraha fi deen. What does that mean? There is no compulsion regarding entry into the deen. It's up to you. And then you have a person who tells you, you know what? I have a problem. I am not yet ready to leave the alcohol that I'm addicted to, but I want to be a Muslim. What do I do? It's a very, very pertinent question. Sometimes a sister might tell you, you know what? I'm not yet ready to put on the full hijab, but I, I want to be a Muslim. What do I do? That small step, be a Muslim for as long as you know that this is the ideal and you start working towards that. Inshallah, you are successful. You are successful. There are so many Muslims who might not be dressed in that way. Why? They are also trying and struggling to get better every day, even if they're moving a millimeter at a time. No problem. So long as they're moving in that direction, there might come a day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open their doors. And who knows, their doors may be more open than ours. So don't let some fear of not being able to practice everything make you back off totally. Because then you're losing the whole goodness. If someone tells you, look, you can jump on the train, but there are no seats. No problem, I'll stand. And as you're standing, guess what? Somebody gets off and you sit down. Subhanallah. So if you don't want to be on the train, you're not going to get to where you're getting to. Jump on. Subhanallah. And then see and taste what it feels like from within. And promise Allah that, Ya Allah, help me to eradicate my bad habits. Help me to be a better person as time passes. This is what draws people to Islam. Islam is not that fanatic religion 
that is only for the bearded few with big, big turbans. No. If you have a beard and a turban, you may be a very good person and you may be a bad person. Just like if you're wearing a jeans and a t-shirt, you may be a very good person or you may be a bad person. The message is, do not judge a book by its cover. Those who appear to be good sometimes are not. Sometimes they are. Those who appear to be terrible are sometimes very good. I have a personal experience. A lot of people who are drug addicts or sometimes alcoholics, if you were to take that habit out of them, sometimes they are better than the whole community put together. And this is what Muhammad, peace be upon him, did. He worked on people. He worked on them. I gave the example once of Junaid Jamshed. I'm sure a lot of you would know him. He says himself, and I'm sure he must have said it if you've sat in any of his talks. He says, you know, I've been everywhere. So my message to the ulama, meaning to the scholars of Islam, don't ever underestimate the guy in the nightclubs. That's what he's saying. That guy in the nightclubs there might turn out to be a person who's got a better platform that the creator has given him to spread the deen and you might lag behind. Amazing. What does this mean? There's hope for everybody. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consolidate what we have within us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. We want Islam. And this is my catch statement. We want Islam to be the fastest growing religion within our own bodies. That's what we want. That's what we want. When I seen this and I said, Subhanallah, the fastest growing religion, I said, it needs to grow from my heart to my hands, quickly. And from my hands to my eyes and my mouth and myself and my face and my hands and my, my feet. And I need everything. My blood should be proper Muslim. The fastest growing religion within my body. And then inshallah, within my family, then within inshallah, my community, and then within those I interact with, and then inshallah, on the globe. Because remember one thing, Allah asks for quality, not quantity. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ Allah says in more than one place in the Quran, He has created death and life in order to test who from amongst you has better deeds? He didn't say more deeds. Better deeds. It's the quality. The quality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. I have a lot to say. There was something I'd want to say about the parrot. Am I right? I think I did say it, but I'm not so sure. It was in the UK the last time I was here, but I'm not so sure where. So I will make mention of it. It's just a joke to show you that in Islam we're also allowed to joke. For as long as the joke is not about any race, not about any religion, no matter what, we're not allowed to draw a cartoon about even the Hindus or the idols, nothing. Allah says, لا تسبوا الذين يدعون من دون الله فيسبوا الله عدوان بغير علم Don't ever mock at anyone worshipping gods and deities besides Allah. Those who are far astray, don't mock about their beliefs, never. Because it will invite them to mock at your faith your expense without knowledge May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us so for as long as no religion no race you know it's just a light joke May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and also we shouldn't be uh, people who pick on others and so on they say or it is said and this is a joke that there was a parrot that could speak and this joke before I start I must make mention it's not against women but it's against people who have pride in them arrogance, haughtiness. According to us in Islam, even your surroundings can pick that up. Your surroundings bear witness for you or against you on the day of judgment. And these surroundings, amazingly, they pick up. They are either in harmony with you or against you. That's why you feel very claustrophobic sometimes and you feel very uneasy, maybe because your spirituality is not, for example, uh, at peace with the surroundings. If, if a spiritual person was to enter a nightclub, they wouldn't feel easy there. They would feel very, very, you know. And the same applies if a person who has absolutely no spirituality, half drunk, wants to walk into the masjid, they wouldn't feel very easy there. Although, under certain conditions, they might also experience the blessings of Allah there. So, the parrot could speak and it was for sale at the pet shop with a little window. Little window overseeing the pavement. And there was a lady walking with her friends with 
making a loud noise with her shoes down the aisle, you know. Lots of arrogance, Allah protect us. And the bird says, hey you, hey you. <laughs> so everybody looks, where did this come from? They turned around and says, oh, this comes from this bird. Wow, you can, wow, you can talk. He says, yes. The bird says, yes. The parrot says, yes. So the parrot looks at this woman who was absolutely arrogant and says, you're ugly. <laughs> Woo, that was bad. She was so embarrassed, very upset, naturally so. And she decided to walk away, you know, blurting a few words and gone. The following day she comes back, same thing happens. Hey you, hey you. She says, oh no. So she looks there, she hadn't changed her ways. She's still the same, arrogance. And the parrot says, you're ugly. She decided, no, I'm going into this shop and I'm waiting for it to open and I want to take these guys to court. So she goes in and she starts tackling the owner. You know, this parrot, I want to sue it for defamation. I want to sue it for this and for that and what. And the guy tries to explain, look, you know, it's just a parrot and it won't happen. And, you know, this. and then he calls the parrot in and says, you know what, this woman, you don't you dare say you're ugly again. It's going to be a big problem, you see. It's going to be a big... So the parrot says, okay. <laughs> So, the woman was very, very excited. The following morning, obviously the parrot had undertaken not to say you're ugly again. The following morning, the woman walks down, even more arrogance. Why? She's convinced that this parrot is now dead meat. You know, dead meat, if it says anything. So she called up all her friends and says, right, we're all walking down the aisle together today. Okay, that's fine, let's go. And she walks with lots of arrogance. She hadn't changed. All she needed to do is just calm down a little bit. And the parrot would have left her. And the parrot's looking very scared, shaking, you know, sees her walking past, doesn't say anything. And then suddenly, as she crosses, the parrot says, hey you, hey you. And she says, what? She looks back and says, what? The parrot says, you know. <laughs> So the moral of the story is, for as long as you don't leave arrogance, you're not going to solve the problem. It will stir, and people, even if they don't tell you that, they know it. If a parrot can know it, those around you know it. So if you want to be a good Muslim, just release those bad habits. Throw them out, and inshallah, everything will be at peace with you. And when another parrot tells you, hey you, you can say, yes, it will tell you, salamu alaikum. <laughs> I think with that, uh, really, we come to the end of this evening's talk. I, to be honest with you, I can continue. But I think we do have time limitations and I'd like to travel. And at the same time, I don't know what the plan is. Uh, maybe there might be a Q&A session, but let me take a seat, inshallah, and we take it from there. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Allah! Uh, the signs of Qiyama. Yeah. The book I was mentioning is it's it's entitled The End of the World. The End of the World, and the the author is Muhammad Al Arifi, uh, and it is published by Darus Salam. I think in Birmingham they do have. Uh, if you if you actually Google it, you'll find it. Darus Salam bookstores. Yeah. Muhammad Al Arifi is, is quite easy to recognize. I think we have a few similarities in our features. Uh, that verse is at the end of the seventh juz. I think it's Surah Al An'am, just before the eighth part of the Quran. Two verses before the eighth part of the Quran, you'll find it there. Yes, sister? I, I, I'm sorry, there's a bit of wax in my ears, sister. <laughs> you want a book? <laughs> oh, the four conditions of maghfirah. Sorry, my sister, you know, I'm a Zimbabwean and I've been traveling and not only the, the altitude that messes your, you know, the hammer and stirrup, but something else as well, meaning the lack of earbuds in Zimbabwe. 
yes, the four conditions of uh, maghfirah, one is you must admit. You know, you don't say, ah, you know, I did this, but I, you know, like, ah, it's okay, it's one of those things, no. You admit, you regret, you seek forgiveness, and you promise not to repeat. Four things. And that's maghfirah, it's guaranteed by the Creator. Yes. Sorry, yes, brother. My beloved brother, wallahi, you've raised a very pertinent issue. And that is to do good deeds and show people those deeds in order to encourage them that they may do the same deeds. Indeed, it is very, very dangerous uh, to tread that path if you're not in complete control of yourself to start with. And that is quite difficult. So what I would suggest is we do deeds, definitely. And we continue doing deeds which will be naturally seen by the others. But to do them in order that they may see you, I would feel that it would be not advisable, especially with the type of weakness that I have and possibly the bulk here, in the sense that it can lead to you thinking that, you know, I'm better, I need to show these people how to do it. But if it's an educational matter, you are allowed to do a deed uh, to teach people whilst you're doing the deed, like you have your children or you have a classroom and you say, look, re I will read Salah and you will read exactly how I read. You're showing them. Uh, but there is also a narration where the Prophet wasallam used to ask for some form of donations for some of the uh, trying times at, uh, during his age and, or era. And he did so publicly. So you find uh, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu came with a portion, everybody saw it. And then Abu Bakr or Umar came with half of what he had and everybody had seen it. And uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came with everything he had and everybody had seen it. And you know, that's when he says you cannot compete with Abu Bakr. And Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْتَبِقُ khayrat," That you know, you should compete with one another when it comes to goodness. Uh, but uh, their level was very, very strong. Today, we are taught in the narration to say that the original rule is to spend in such a way that even your left hand doesn't know what your right hand has spent. That is sincere. Because uh, I, I, I do understand exactly what you're saying. But I feel that today, uh, the weakness that we have within us is such that if we were to start sh doing things to show people off, it would probably result in clean arrogance and we'd be justifying it. And that's my fear. So if that is feared, it's better not to do that. Wallahu a'lam, you may find someone mentioning something else, but that's my opinion. Thank you, brother. Jazakallah khair. I think it seems like uh, you want to ask a question. I think it seems like I don't see any more hands unless oh, there's one more there, mashallah. Salam. I think my beloved brother, you know, the truth is we need to be steadfast. We need to be steadfast and we need to be living Muslims. Believe me, people are fed up of what they have, even in the West. If you go to some Western countries, you know, that life of music and dancing and gambling and, and clubbing and, and everything. And, you know, everything is okay. No rules, no regulations, problems in the home with, you know, promiscuity and insecurity and everything makes them completely fed up. There comes a time when an intellectual begins to think that I need some rules in order to get happiness because in life you need a balanced approach in order to achieve some goodness. And when you are on one extreme, either one of the two extremes, you don't get that balance. Islam offers you the solution and it is the only religion that offers you a pure, unambiguous solution. 
and it is there with rules and regulations, nobody changes it. You know, no pope or no rabbi can change what Islam says. And the reality is you might have a few different interpretations. We follow the middle path. We follow the moderate path. And we know and understand that we have to live in the world. We cannot shove our opinions down the throats of everybody else. And this is why if you, if you have heard what I said whilst we were speaking, I did say that the world out there is free. It's up to us to choose. Like someone might choose not to be a Muslim. Someone might choose to be a Muslim. We cannot hold something against the other. It is Allah who will judge for them or against them. But what we need to do is the more exemplary we become, we will automatically be da'is. Like I said, Indonesia, for example, Islam went there through the business people. They were honest, they were upright. And this is how Islam spread. If we are honest and upright, no matter what the other person is, there might be a gay, there might be someone you totally disagree with. For you to be able to communicate with them in a way that they are attracted somehow to Islam more than they were the moment before they met you, you have succeeded even if they don't accept the faith and they don't leave their bad ways. Because subhanallah, you know, hidayah is a word. It means guidance. Guidance comes sometimes in stages and sometimes the door just flings open, you know. So it depends. People sometimes want to be Muslim, but something's blocking them. For them to make that step, you know, they need the courage to say, look, I'm here and I'd like to accept the faith. And that's what it is. Now with us as Muslimin, I agree with you that there is a lot of negative publicity, not only uh, by non-Muslims, but sadly, I think even by some Muslims who don't have knowledge of Islam. And they are portraying the wrong image of Islam by engaging in acts that Islam does not teach. And if, if that is the case, and it is happening, then surely it is up to people like myself and yourselves to present the correct image of Islam by being exemplary. Because no matter how much lip service we pay, we are not going to be able to convince people that Islam is the true religion. <coughs> unless and until we stop just paying that lip service and we begin to practically be the best people, the biggest assets to your varsity to start with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Now, sorry, the sister right at the back. You know, I personally, I don't record any of my stuff. Nothing at all. I don't get involved in a recording at all. But there are some brothers who've created a website. Somebody told me lately that uh, the, the downloads don't work and so on. Because I've got nothing to do with it, actually. Uh, not because I don't want to. I don't really have the time to. And so there are no copyrights whatsoever. For as long as it is not edited to portray a negative meaning, because I'm quite careful with what I say. And uh, we're all human at the end of the day. We might, you know, Whatever I've said that's wrong is from Shaytan and from me, but whatever is correct is definitely from the Almighty. Uh, you, there are some places, I think, online that you might be able to purchase, but if you buy one copy and copy for everybody else, I don't have a problem with it. I don't believe in royalties. I don't believe in anything of that nature. When it comes to qala Allahu wa qala Rasulu, everything is free. Sorry, brother. Yes. The one about it, yes. The brother with a grey jersey. Yes. <laughs> brother, I think we are dealing with a far greater issue at the moment here, and that is the fastest growing religion. And we need to actually deal with that. You know, there would be people... They have a choice. You know, to be honest with you, if I am going to, uh, you know, start imposing on people that they need to be Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali or Salafi, I'm actually going to create a disaster. I want to leave De Montfort, having united the people, not having split them, my beloved brother. <laughs> yes, my brother. My brother, firstly, you avoid arrogance when giving advice by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you uh, to protect you from shaitan, the condemned, the accursed. And secondly, to be humble when giving advice. And I feel, and I've tried it, and I hope Allah does not you know, punish me if I've gone wrong. Uh, I, I always like to include myself in the advice. I say we and us and, and myself and we all myself and we all need and I need it more than you and so on. There are words that you could use which would actually 
make yourself one of the crowd and believe me it's more effective than when you say you guys need this and you guys need that uh, that's what I use and that's also taught by the Prophet ﷺ. He used to use beautiful words, though he was the messenger. So I feel that a lot of uh, scholars sometimes who tend to address people as, you know, you are this and you are that. Uh, yes, it has an impact, but for me, I'm not on that level, definitely not. I would like to say, you know, brothers, we need to improve, we need to do this, I need to do this, we all need to, and so on. And inshallah, that would help. Uh, also, when we're doing something, we should do it sincerely for the sake of Allah, and we should try and emanate the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in teaching. Jazakallah khair brother. I think with that, there is a sister at the top there. My sister, it's difficult. You, because, uh, you know, there is so much that is on offer. I was, I've come with a little booklet. I might give it to one of the brothers here which was distributed at the World Cup in South Africa. It says Muhammad, a biography, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and some rules of Islam and so on. It's a lovely booklet which they dished out at the World Cup in South Africa. And I think it's a beautiful book. And I think it's somewhere that a non-Muslim can actually start. I always tell people, you know, the non-Muslims are going to grab us by our necks on the day of Qiyamah to say, I knew this sister or this brother for 20 years. Not a day did they tell me, hey, this is what I believe. This is my religion. They're going to grab. Oh, look, whether they think that in this world or not, we believe it. Because, wallahi, if you are a Muslim, you know, I went to a private school which was quite a Christian college. And to be honest with you, I studied religion. And I am convinced that if you are following proper Islam, there is no way that anybody could even debate with you. Because, you know, it, it makes you such a beautiful person, so good. And it actually leaves you worshipping in a manner that you know it's me, my creator. I don't involve a third party. I do it the way the Prophet taught it to me and it's me and my creator. I render my prayer directly for him. I ask him, I raise my hands and I say, Oh my maker, oh you whom I'm going to return to, grant me goodness when I return to you. What risk have you taken? It gives you such a comfort. That's Islam. So, to start with something that is very, uh, should I say, educative, and unbiased because sometimes you have people pulling in their direction and I don't like that you know uh, and this is why I avoided a question that one of the brothers asked which was a valid question but I avoided it because I wouldn't like to pull in this direction and that brother if you're a Muslim or sister you're a Muslim you're a good Muslim or you want to enter the fold of Islam study the different sects see where you fit in to be honest with you look at what is most pristine look at what is there look at what really who invited you to Islam or what intrigued you what pulled you towards it and ask them I think that would be a way because what's the point of having been invited to Islam through the deeds of a certain person and then heading in a totally different direction when you'd actually want to enter the fold I don't know that's just common sense to me but it's it's difficult to answer the question because someone who might not be uh, following a specific sect might say no they must be my sect you know I think we need to be Muslimin to start with you know, we're, we're living in a world that is so cosmopolitan and what divides us sometimes is something beyond what is meant to be dividing us. May Allah protect us. Not to say that anything should be dividing us, but if anything, it should be a sin that should separate people in the sense that when you are choosing your company, it shouldn't be, oh, this person's that Muslim and I'm this Muslim and this is that Muslim and so on. For as long as they are avoiding sin and they are brilliant company, sometimes even the non-Muslims, you might want to, or you might have, you know, people who are your friends who are not Muslim because they have more sober habits than Muslims. Allah knows best. Sorry, my sister, I, maybe I didn't answer your question so properly, but, you know, I, I really am sometimes in a quagma when we need to, talk about exactly what steps to take and so on. There are different people out there. I might be here in De Montfort today. You might not see me again or you might see me after a long, long time. And it's no point in me saying, look, you know, you need to keep in touch with me because the truth is I can't. And the truth is I'm an extremely busy person and, you know, there are ulama here. I think maybe you should uh, make use of them. In fact, you must. Yes, brother with the blue. Uh, the stepfather and so on. Look, in Islam, a man and a woman has their own identity. Even when you marry, you're not supposed to change your name. As a woman, you have the right to maintain your identity. You remain that, you will be called by your father's name on the day of Qiyamah, that's on the day of judgment. Uh, not by your mother's name like some say. But you will be called by your father's name. 
and you have the right and you should not change your identity when you're married you keep your father's name but if for some reason it will facilitate immigration laws it will facilitate your living in this world without deceiving or cheating anyone that their lineage is anything other than what exactly it is you may you may according to some scholars change it though some feel a little bit more strongly about it uh, I am one of them but I still would agree with the opinion of those who feel slightly lighter about it to say if there's no deception in it there's no cheating in it and there's no trying to hide in it uh, then you may use a name for purposes of living in the world like your certificates or maybe your facilitation of travel facilitation of immigration and so on uh, sometimes if you don't change your name it might be a problem Allah knows best uh, my teaching from the Quran and Sunnah what I learn is as far as possible try not to change it Quran. تعدد الجمع الجمعة تعدد الجماعات يعني إيش تقصدي أنت يعني or the different groups and so on okay تعدد الجماعات meaning the different sects of the Muslims and so on okay do you see how you would explain to a non-Muslim you know, every religion has sects in Christianity, Judaism, every religion, including uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam and so on, uh, as well as uh, the other little faiths like Baha'is and the Hindus, they all have sects. So it's, it's quite easy to understand that, you know, uh, in Islam, naturally, there are people who interpret things differently. Uh, some of these jama'at are based on, some of the, the different sects are based on a jurisprudence difference, which is not major. You know, if it's based on the jurisprudence difference, like whether to raise your hands in salah, whether not to raise your hands, it's minor. It's a very, very small, uh, you know, difference. But when it comes to differences in belief, it becomes a little bit greater. And sometimes, you know, we, we, can, we need to learn it. We need to learn what the different people believe in order to be able to explain it to someone else. Because if we don't, we won't be able to. I can tell you this person is this, that person is that, this person is is this and that and I don't even want to use those words but if I say all that it's difficult to explain to a Muslim who doesn't even know and if we don't know it will remain a name and in the short time that I have I won't be able to explain to you the variety of sects but you, you can explain or say that look there are different sects and what we need to do is be as close as possible to what Allah's teachings are and what the hadith or, or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ has come with and if there are jurisprudence differences it's not very big it's a minor issue the, the, when it comes to a difference in belief, it becomes a bit bigger. And that's where we need to see where we fit in by finding that which is as pristine as possible. Allah knows best. I think with that we come to an end. Uh, the food is definitely getting cold. The, 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 the young boy who is there, I will answer your question personally when you come down here just now. Oh, I can even come up to you, don't worry, inshallah. Just a few moments, inshallah. Barakallah feed. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Christian City, Christian City, Christian City,